Hey, what's up, Zay? Hi, Moses. How are you, Shay? Good to see you, Good to see you, too. Well, we're quite a little crowd of Beautiful faces. I tell you, I tell you. Why are they all gathered here? Oh, they're gathered for a keynote event. Which is? Open the world for free to Africa. Oh, wow, and who's this event by? It's by the Africa Awareness Initiative. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. It about is. Ask for the band. It sounds like it's about literature. It is. How do you tie literature and that can be given away in a university? Oh, I think, you know, especially for us Africans, Literature has been so key in reclaiming our voice and telling our stories and representing ourselves. Um, you know that given the context of academia, it's what we try to do as an organization as Africa Awareness Initiative. What do you do for academia as Africa Awareness Initiative? Well, the initiative aims to sort of advocate for a stronger African studies program on campus. Um, that's what we do. We believe that it is paramount, it's key, you know, for there to be an African voice represented within academia through the form of the African Studies program. Um, that's what we and do. what's the state of the African Studies program as you stand? <sighs> Starting in 2002, you know, the Africa Awareness Initiative has come through such a long journey um, with a lot of support from faculty, from staff, from UBC members. Um, and now we have a fully standard African Studies minor program. Um, but like everything else, like, you know, Africa, like African literature, like the state of African Studies in academia, there's such a long way to go. Um, our dream is to just have a fully standing department of African studies within the university. Well, what would that be for students on campus? It will give them a chance to learn. You know, we feel like that opportunity is currently lacking at the university. It will just give them the chance to educate themselves around Africa, the complexities, the issues, the diversity that exists there. All right, drawing you back to the idea of literature and African stories, what purpose does this have within Africa? Just like the African Studies program, you know, African literature served for us Africans to educate, um, to inform, to pass on traditions. Oh, pass on tradition, very excellent one. Also building community. Building community as well. I remember when I was a kid, maybe eight years old, my grandmother would gather us around this little fire and she'd feed us these potatoes, it was amazing. And she'd tell us all these, <laughs> she'd tell us all these lovely stories about how the donkey survived trials and tribulations to get out of its tricky situation. Or well, the Nigerian story, or how the Jojo's book its shell. Yeah. And even if we didn't understand each of the meanings back then, each story had meaning, each story had purpose, and each story had a message that would carry with us for their small lives. And that's something that I find really, really impressive and really, really amazing about writing within Africa. And it exists through you know, the entire continent in one shape or another. Storytelling, writing, African literature has just become such a core part of who we are and what we do. And even if you look at the African Studies program on campus, um, I think we're so proud that such a huge portion of it has been dedicated to literature because that's how we learned. That's how I learned about where I'm from and you know, who I am now. Right. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored and privileged to have one such excellent writer amongst us, a storyteller. No Violet is so committed to her craft that she went on to perfect it and receive a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Cornell. And she's so dedicated to it that she needs to teach people within the same university. The world has gone on to recognize her work. And so last year, she received the Kane Award for her work, which has been excellent. We've had a chance to look at some of it, and it's mind blowing. And she's also been featured in lots of articles and lots of journals, even in our blessed motherland, where she was born in Zimbabwe, and also in South Africa, and in Switzerland, and in journals all around the world. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged to have her with us. And so please join me in welcoming Nova Island. So I was going to start by reading a piece of my writing, a big piece of my writing. About 10 pages or so, but I instead decided to do just two pages um, because I read twice earlier on this morning and my voice is kind of, my throat is kind of stressed. So I'll read just a, a short, short piece um, so that people can can hear how I work. Um, I play with words, you know, and language is the currency of my art, obviously. Um, I'm going to read a piece entitled Diaspora Christmas. Some of you may have read it on my blog. Um, we are just coming from the Christmas break, I guess. And I was thinking in terms of my friends going back home um, and being with their families and what it means. Diaspora Christmas. Come December, the year folds its wings like a great tired bed, and they return home for Christmas. 
One minute it's quiet, and the next they are swarming, spewing, spilling, just eating up the place and squeezing breath out of the air. When the air gags and chokes, they just keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. Diaspora. They are famished for their land and are savage in their love, and they don't care if they draw blood. The ones from South Africa always get here first, like somebody set their feet on fire and pointed them to the road. Big luggage, trendy clothes, quick accents. Gleaming cars thunder down location streets and drench us in dust. We give way. We are neither upset nor envious because we know they do not own the cars, that they'll never own them. When these ones speak to us with those new accents, the weight of feathers, they never meet our eyes. Likewise, we find other places to look, the color of a printed shirt, the pointed tip of a shoe, the magnificent glint of an earring. We are careful not to let our eyes rest too long on the scars on their bodies. We also do not ask about the ones never to return, those who died in the shanty fires over there, bodies bent black because they came from another country. There's not much to say about the ones from Botswana. These ones just look battered, like Sipo there, not even 20, and you'd think he was an old, old man. Hands of rubble, his body drags after him when he walks, a thin thing falling apart. It's all that working in those Botswana fields. It will do that to a person. Always we watch these ones return and think, why even go when you come back looking like this? You can tell the ones from America and Britain and Dubai and France and them because these ones come by air. They are also the richest. British pounds, American dollars, euros, francs, what, what, any money you think of, they have. But then they are always careful to spend it. You think they have bled and slaved for it. These ones walk with the gait of the aged. Feet stay long on the earth, reluctant to part with the ground. This is their prayer that the land remembers them. When these ones come bearing children who don't speak our languages, who are sickened by our foods, who are afraid of death, we avoid their eyes. We hold the children to the sun like said tokens and smile. But what we really want to ask the parents is, what have you done? When these ones pounce with gadgets and take pictures and everything they see, we are patient with them because we know that this is what they must do in order to survive over there. Come December, the year folds its wings like a great tired bed and they return home for Christmas. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you all for coming out today. Thank you to the University of British Columbia and a very special thank you to the Africa Awareness Initiative for having me here and most importantly Thank you for your presence on this campus. I have read the story of how you came about back in 2002, and you make me proud. If I may speak on behalf of our motherland, then on behalf of Africa, land of Chinua Achebe, land of Bessie Head, land of Dambuzo Marechera, land of Nguki Wathiongo, land of Pinyavanga Wainana, land of Pepetela, land of Nawal El Sadawi, land of Ausman Sembene, J.M. Kotsia, land of Chimamanda Adichi, and Von Vera, among many, many great writers. If I may speak on behalf of our Africa, then please let me say to the Africa Awareness Initiative, thank you for insisting on Africa's presence on this campus. Thank you for insisting on our importance, on our brilliance, on our dignity, on our relevance, on our relevance, on our relevance. Because I am sure you know, and if you don't know, 
then now you know that the African image in the Western imagination has always been problematic. And I have no doubt that through your existence, Africa is being held to the sun. To that end, I would like to say, I stand in solidarity with you all in your aspiration to advocate for a more sustainable African studies program. May this worthy vision be a reality in our lifetime because it is about time, because the African studies is as legitimate and relevant as any other. So in the spirit of this conference that I'm happy to be part of, I come to you from Africa with love, of course, but I also come to you bearing pens and books because I am a writer. What this means, in part, is that I am interested among other things in issues of readership and given where we are today and the concerns of the African Awareness, Africa Awareness Initiative, I am interested in the importance of reading African letters in Western higher education. But perhaps it is necessary to start by remembering African literature's difficult journey in the West. It was in 1784 that Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia made the following observation. Never yet could I find that a black man uttered a thought above the level of plain narration. Never saw even an elementary trait of painting or sculpture. It was in 1903 that Joseph Conrad wrote The Racist Heart of Darkness. One text among many of culturally ignorant writings by Westerners writing Africa. I very much doubt that these players ever foresaw the emergence and flowering of an African canon that will bring to the world notable works of rhetoric, poetry, drama, the novel, and others. The year is 2012, and the African writer has since taken the pens and the power and his narrative back to write his own story on his own terms, as it should be. And yes, Africa occupies its space among other world literatures. As a young writer writing today, I celebrate where I stand, knowing that I come from a people who wrote our voices, our experience, our humanity into being. As an aside here, I will pause and modify with the words in neural language because, of course, I do not want to support the impression that we owe our literature to the West, but that's a different topic for another day. Now, with this development in the state of African letters, one would then naturally expect the Western higher institutions of learning to catch on in a way that reflects a more democratic scope of world literature. In other words, an English department, given its centrality, would have to actively bring, out, bring in other literatures from the marches, including African literature, because it's just as important. Now, when I come into an institution like UPC and fail to find a single African writer in this big and beautiful campus, and fail to find a meaningful presence of African literature in the English and African studies departments combined. And hear sentiments like, you are the first African writer to ever visit my classes. Then it becomes a cause for concern. One that is made even more pronounced by the fact that UBC is not just an institution of higher learning, but it's supposed to be a leading institution. It is a situation that begs us to pause and ponder. What does it mean for a higher institution of learning to have very little coverage of African literature today? But before I address this, I'd like to digress for a minute and remind people of, an, of the ignorant Westerner story. The one who thinks Africa is a country and that Mandela is the president of that one country. In short, the one who knows what Chimamanda Adichie warns us against 
in her famous lecture, The Danger of a Single Story. Now let's assume that this person passed through, through the University of X, because interestingly, you will find educated people as believers and bearers of that single story. Now let's say they passed through this University of X and could have taken a couple of African literature classes, but they did not because these classes were not offered. And while we are here, let us remember the qualities that make literature golden. It humanizes, it enlightens, it connects us to worlds removed from our own, just to mention a few. What this scenario translates to, and this is where I will recall my previous question, what does it mean for a higher institution of learning to have very little coverage of African literature? Well, we have heard the saying, the carpenter will always blame his tools. But I, I, I beg that we give that carpenter a break and actually look at his tools for a minute. In this case, the said University of X, a place that was unable to offer the carpenter, the student, a healthy selection of African literature courses. What this same scenario means is that the said higher institution of learning, besides failing to represent a holistic image of literature, becomes complicit in the oblivion of his student. His education then becomes one of omission, a loss that shortchanges the student's perception and experience of Africa and Africans. If the student is supposed to be a citizen of the world, which I am sure is what UPC strives to make of his students, then the absence of the African narrative in that student's imagination makes him poorer, remembering how education, the right education that is, is transformative in terms of how we see ourselves, other people, and the world. May I say that my comments on giving the carpenter a break in this case and looking at his tools is inspired by my position as a teacher. I'm a proud graduate and teacher of Cornell University, as you may have heard from the introduction, and it's the kinds of students that, get, that I get in my class um, that inspires me to take the stance I'm making in this talk. Fair enough, when the students first come and I ask them what African writers uh, they have read, most probably they have read Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. And for the most part, that text and the media is all that serves as their point of reference when it comes to Africa. And this is not necessarily useful, especially the media part, given the Western media's problematic gaze on Africa as nothing but a land of disease, poverty, and war. Still, I will mention that my students, who are also coming from various departments, engineering, government, the sciences, math, are intelligent, are curious, and are ready to read African literature or anything that I put on the table. Because at the core of African literature, just like any other literature, is the human experience. Just as I was able to read through the cultural codes of Shakespeare, Dickens, Defoe, as a kid growing up in Africa, my students are able to read Tsitsi Dangarem Gasneva's conditions and discuss it, not as a cultural phenomena, but in relation to themselves. They are able to own the narrative in ways that speak to the universalizing power of letters. When this happens, I think something is being repaired, is being fixed in the way students see and read Africa. And in this, I am hopeful. I am hopeful because I know that my students will leave Cornell with a transformed and humanized vision of Africa, only because they have had the experience of the African in his own voice and his own hand. I had the privilege this morning of visiting two classes one on African democracy and one on African literature. And the students there very much reminded me of mine. They were interested, they were intelligent, 
and they were ready to learn. The challenge for the University of British Columbia then, as in any other institution of higher learning, is to educate these young minds who will one day engage with the world and lead the world, a world of which part Africa is very much a part of. The reading of African letters will help make the students ready. May you not deny them the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nivala, for your speech. We'll now be open to a brief question and answer period where we can share some of Nivala's great experience. So, are there any questions from the audience? I have a question that I've been wondering about for a long time. Okay. Can what you is get my two Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you so good. much. My question is, what drives you? What keeps you going story after story day after day? Um, what, what keeps me going, I think, is the same that keeps people everywhere doing the things they love doing. Um, but for me, it's the service that I, I do for us all through, through literature. Because I, I think writers and artists really feed the soul uh, of the people. And that's something that I appreciate and still appreciate in my life through music and other forms of art. And where do you see the future of African literature being? Um, it's bright. I, I think it's bright, and especially given the fact that African literature, in your language, is, is, is young. Um, but looking at where we are and where we are going, I think that there's so much, there's so much promise, and there's so much potential. More, more people are writing. Um, people in the margins are writing, but I'd like to see more representation of, of, of African women writers, um, representation of, of sexual minorities in Africa, uh, gay and lesbian voices. I'd like to see voices of children writing. So I think it can be, it's promising, but it can be more, more democratic. Um, what role do we as young Africans, lovers of Africa, what role do we play in you know, the progress and the growth of current African literature? I think you have to read. Um, the interesting thing with reading, from my experience in the university setting, is that people outside the humanities think it's not something that they should be doing. Um, you ask somebody and they'll tell you they read two, two, three books a year. Um, I don't know if, I don't know what the responses would be like if, if we went around the room and asked you. But I think for me it's a dialogue. I write so that you can read and hopefully connect with you on the page. But what's important is that I'm writing about our world. So if more people read, we are not only supporting the writer, but they also be part of the, the conversation. Hi, thank you for your talk. That was great. Thank you. Um, when you're writing, you're in, and you, you, you've got your focus on a, the subject matter, mm -hmm. do you think about your audience as the North American person that hasn't experienced Africa? Mm -hmm. Or are you writing for Africans in Africa? Because often readers in Africa are reading stories that are painting a picture, not about them, but a picture of people here and what we're supposedly like in okay. North America. So there's, there, there's always a disconnect when people are reading stories, fictional, mm -hmm. fictional stories. Um, so long and short of it is, when you're writing towards or to your audience, who are you writing to? Okay, I'll, I'll just stand up so that I'm not done. I've heard that question a lot. And I think the, the interesting thing is I hear it from people who don't write. And I guess in a sense I understand, I understand where it's coming from. 
But with me, when I'm writing, I'm not really writing for a specific audience. I'm writing mostly because a certain story needs to be put on the page. But obviously, whenever readers encounter us, they would naturally you know, consider the kind of things that you, you came up with. My positioning in the West at this time makes people believe that, well, I'm in the West, I'm writing for the West, but that's not the case. Um, and I'll also point, that, point out that my writing is a big part of me in it. So my own lived experience somehow always finds its way on the page. So to that end, I can say I'm also writing you know, for, for me in a way. I don't know how that makes me look. But yeah, I, I also write for me in a way. But then my, my ideal reader is, is a human being. You know, because it, it, it's literature is for us all. It doesn't matter if they are African or Western or, or whatever. But it is an interesting thing because when you are looking at Africans in the diaspora and the politics of African representation, there's a feeling that we are getting right. African writers are writing that single story, um, especially when you look at the less desirable elements of African life. And my question is, OK, I did not have a Mickey Glass upbringing in Africa. I am the kid in my stories. Um, life was kind of tough. I grew up hustling and all those things. Now, where would I get the experience to write you know, that story um, that would make us look good? So as an artist, I feel like I, I don't have to, to, to prostitute my story um, so that I present a certain image of Africa. But that said, I would like to see those Africans who have, we have those positive stories to write them so that we have these uh, different narratives about us. Well, yeah, that's, um, the, the, and the question comes from the woman who wrote um, Half of a Yellow Sun. Yes. That's one of, that was one of her things was like, you know, when she was growing up in the books, the stories that she read in Africa were stories that were being produced out from, from North America. Uh -huh. So she had a different perception of what it was like until she got here. And then vice versa, the people that she met when she came to, to university in the States mm -hmm. had a different perception of Africans because the stories that they were used to seeing about Africa was stereotypes of, yes. you know, you live with the animals and all of these mm -hmm. things, right? Yes. So, so that's where the question comes out of. Um, I personally think that stories should be just, should be written as stories and mm -hmm. for the joys of everybody and everybody should have a connection mm -hmm. uh, in some way or the other. My experience with your book may be different than my neighbor's experience with your book, but either way it should be a positive experience That's that you true. walk away That's from. True. Um, and so um, so it, it just want to make sure there's that there's there's this confusion or even just to get your perception of you know, what can these stories provide for people back in Africa and for people here? How can we encourage people to read more African stories and say, you know, um, that the writers are producing content that can relate to everybody and that does mm -hmm. relate to everybody? Okay, uh, you mean encouraging people over here? Well, here and in Africa. Um, like, Africans should read African literature too? I think. You know, part of the problem is that the, the state of the book in Africa um, is not very good, unfortunately. It's very sad to say. I was speaking in a class earlier today, and I was talking about how um, in my country, for example, we publish less than 10 books a year because one of the reasons is that it's because it's becoming expensive for the publishers. Zimbabwe is really rising up from the dust in terms of what was happening economically. Uh, a few years ago, but I believe that there are artists. There are more than there are definitely more than ten artists. So in that situation, you can see how how shortchanged people become. And then there's the thing of people not really being able to afford books when people have to make the choice of buying food or buying books. I think I would buy food myself, um, and that that really becomes a, a problem. There's a disconnect between our potential, the stories we are capable of telling, and the stories that are coming out there. And in the West, I think people are, uh, people are ready to read um, anything good that's, that's coming out. I think there's a misconception that the West is looking for certain kind of stories. But we really never get enough writers, African writers, writing and sending, peop uh, sending work over here. Mm -hmm. I have recently been in touch with young African writers via Facebook. People 
well, I always complain, but people just send me stories and say, read this. Um, and as a teacher of writing, I can see that people need to work on craft. Uh, as somebody who started writing, I wasn't writing seriously, but I studied in Africa in a way. I was not taught craft, but I just wrote. I think my teachers spoke of how I had talent, but nobody sat me down and told me about scene and dialogue and plot and all those things. And one of my, you know, my goals is to go back and start doing writing workshops as a way of giving back and kind of nurturing uh, people's voices who might otherwise not write if they didn't have the, the opportunity. Thank you, Isabel. Yes. I think Julia's question. Um, hi, thank you for coming. Um, thank you, for especially on such a cold, cold day. It's one of the coldest days we've had this year. Um, I want to uh, respond to your, your speech mm -hmm. and also to tell you that I was, I was really pleased to be able, I'm really pleased to be able to say what a great story you wrote last year. Thank I you. read it and I was blown away, the, the street children's story, Thank the you. wonderful ones that came by. Mm -hmm. And your voice with the children was really very good. But um, what I want to respond to coming from an African who grew up in Africa with African stories and African writers, mm -hmm. I being the daughter of an African mm -hmm. writer as well, mm -hmm. um, I thought that was how the rest of the world was. And I was really shocked to discover that people didn't know this, right? Yeah. And um, so with that in mind, I come to UBC and I've been here for a while. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also spoiled in the sense that I'm really aware of the work that the African um, studies has been doing, mm -hmm. and we have an instructor sitting here from that department, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's one of those things. I, I'm, I'm so proud of the work that's being done so far. Uh, Professor Gloria is doing mm -hmm. amazing work with her husband, and Suzanne James, and, and, and Laura Moss. There's a bunch of other instructors who, who are really passionate about African literature and African work. Uh -huh. and, and we're like the, the carpenters too that are really new. They're still shiny, they haven't yes. taken enough nails yet. Mm -hmm. But they're there, and they know what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I just want to say that welcome to this university of shiny tools. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think everything has to start somewhere. And from what I heard from talking to students, people are working hard and they are hoping as time goes, the, the program will expand. I think UPC, I personally think UPC can do more than a, a minor. I think it can do a major. You know, if it, if it can give so much attention to Chinese studies, you know, and other, other departments, why would African literature lag behind? So, yeah, I, I really applaud your, you know, your efforts. I'm an educator myself, um, and I have respect for for teachers, so keep, 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 keep working, keep working hard. It is a beautiful campus. I wouldn't mind coming here for a semester or a year um, <laughs> and, and, and teaching and hanging out in, in Vancouver, seriously. Mr. President, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I'm really, really, I really enjoy it. Actually, I'm not a literate person, I'm a linguist. Okay. But I'm more interested in the use of the language you use in your writing. Mm -hmm. Because if you know somebody named Boogie White Jungle, yes. he talks about how we should not use any foreign language to write anything. Mm -hmm. Because the language music is not possible, it's not enough to carry the message of the cultural African okay. cultural value system. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you think? Do you think that it's a good idea? Because sometimes you're writing in English, you're focusing on that and you're trying to educate African people, some are using French or using English mm -hmm. or using a language they, they do not know. Okay. Do you think that's going to be a problem or do you think that it's okay also to use the, the, the foreign language to actually write about something? Um, I will start by saying Luke is awesome, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know where he's coming from. I can see where he's coming from, but the thing is, if I were to write in an African language, I'm, Debele, I'm Zimba, from Zimbabwe, I'm Debele, which is the second largest tribe. The first tribe is Shona. Um, I speak Shona because I picked it up from the playgrounds. I cannot write in Shona. If I were to write in my language, which I also do, one of my mentors is a 
is in the very novelist and she's pushing me to, to write and I'm doing that. But if I were to write in my language, it means the other tribes, the other seven tribes in Zimbabwe would not be able to read me. But if I'm writing in English, uh, not only the other seven tribes, but it means beyond the Zimbabwean borders, I would never be read. And I'm saying this as somebody who is saddened by the fact that I think some of our greatest texts in Zimbabwe are written in Debele and Shona. Those are texts that would make it to the world stage if they were not in English, but they will never be known. Why? Because that language is not accessible. In as much as writing in a foreign language is problematic, especially given how those foreign languages came to us, they came to us through violence. It is problematic, I can see where Nguki is coming from. But the practicality is that we are using those, language, those languages to speak to, to speak to humanity. So that English is, is, is giving us something that allows us to, to, go across, to go across borders. But at the same time, yes, um, we should still continue writing in our languages. I think, I don't know anybody else in the younger generation of Zimbabwean writers who is writing the native languages. So, it, you know, in 20 years, I think they might be dead if people don't write. I hope that doesn't happen. Before I answer you, let me finish answering this brother over here. <laughs> I also wanted to say that the fact that I'm writing in English doesn't mean that I'm writing in English. Um, earlier today, somebody asked me if I think in my language or whatnot. If you look at, if you look at my words on paper, um, you know, I did my, my first master's in English literature and I was bored by all the high sounding ways that academics express themselves and how they exclude people. So for me, I try to write in my language and then put it in English. And I think when I do that, you set me apart from a person, an Englishman, for example. So I try to retain that cultural flavor of mine by going through that process. And I think that's the best we can do under the circumstances. Um, coming back to you, Okay, can you remind me? <laughs> I have a rough idea, but I need you to say it. No, I, I just wanted to know, uh, when you were mentioning um, your, your wish mm -hmm. that more African minorities would speak up mm -hmm. and um, gay and lesbian voices, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think that effect would be on the West's perception of Africa, but also Africans, Africans' perception of us? Okay. Um, I'll talk about African perceptions of ourselves because I don't care about how the West sees us. Sorry, sorry West. <laughs> uh, but I, I really don't think that should be my concern because I think it's problematic when, when an artist thinks that way. But the first obvious result is that I am against any form of silencing uh, as a human being and as an artist. And one of the, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I was able to, to uh, what do you call, see my, my languages are tripping now, <laughs> but <laughs> let me rephrase. But with Facebook, which I was reluctant to join, um, I was exposed to su such a vi variety of, of young people, young African writers, and I was very impressed to encounter this gay Zimbabwean brother who now lives in South Africa because he cannot live in Zimbabwe because uh, homosexuality is illegal. Not that I'm trying to offend anybody's beliefs here. But one of the things that I saw is that I read, I was able for the first time to read, to read something by a Zimbabwean, uh, by a proud gay brother from Zimbabwe. And his perspective 
in a way, I think is something that has been missing in our letters, and I think across Africa as well. What is that gonna do to us as a people? Since I said literature humanizes, literature enlightens, there's a lot of, of, of ignorance and stigma and, you know, about not just in Africa, anywhere. Um, and if you look at how writing has really held people in their struggles for, for human rights, um, social struggles, I, I think that's part of our redemption. That's gonna be part of our redemption. But it doesn't make me feel good knowing that what I'm writing is not representative of the next person in line because their story is simply not told. Any other question? Um, Monica Arach, who, who won the King Prize, I think, a year or two before you. Yes. One for the Jambula Tree. Jambula Tree, yes. And it was a story in which she had two characters having a, um, it wasn't overtly a sexual experience, but two female characters and the response in Uganda was quite um, dramatic mm -hmm. because people, there's a lot of right, um, people saying that that's not um, representative of us, mm -hmm. even though that is representative mm -hmm. of us. Yes, right? yes. Um, I don't think Monica was writing a gay story per se because mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a, a gay story or a non gay story. I mean, mm -hmm. I think stories are stories of few, as yes. long as they're human stories. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I think the dialogue about uh, what makes an African story really is, is the same kind of dialogue you have about what makes a, a Canadian story or what makes a, a Finnish story. It's a, a human story is a human story. So yeah. I think you're absolutely right. The silencing is the crime. Yeah, the, the silencing is, is the crime. And I, and I think people, I hope people have the courage to, to write. And the good thing with writing is that you can choose to be anonymous and just write and put your work out there. Um, that people will be removed from, from the person delivering the message. I think people can sit down and think, you know, and see, and see alternative realities. Yes? You, you referred in, in the story you read to us, you referred to how you looked at those who came. Mm -hmm and couldn't speak the mother tongue. Yes. And that for me is, is, is a really painful point. Mm -hmm. uh, as a South African uh, who's been exposed mostly to English in terms mm -hmm. of education, but now I'm taking books uh, from my mother language and I'm trying to read them. Mm -hmm. And I read 10 times as slow as I do in those as I do in English. And it cleans me. Uh, and it, you were kind of hinting to it when you're addressing the uh, professor's question here, but I, I'm one that, that is hesitant mm -hmm. to let go of our languages. I, I think that even though, yes, our mm -hmm. stories would be limited in terms of if I write it's a baby, mm -hmm. only those will be able to hear it. Mm -hmm. My question, I guess, is should we be letting those go at the cost of saying, let's get our stories out there? Mm -hmm. Or should it be that? Let's, let's, let's keep them alive because they, they have in them mm -hmm. values and they identify who we are mm -hmm. as a people. And language is one of those common factors that mm -hmm. if now I start speaking to you in the valley, mm -hmm. immediately, you know, the, the connection and the relations go well beyond just mm -hmm. a speaker and someone in the audience. Mm -hmm. So that's the power that's in language. And I'm wondering if we're losing that as Africans. Like, what, what is that? What is that saying about us going forward? Um, I, I'd like to start by saying, you know, my, my support of writing in English does not in any way mean I am dismissing, you know, our own languages. But I'm saying if, if, a, if a writer has to make that choice. That said, I think we're losing, the reality is that we're losing something, something is being lost. Because if you are looking at Africans writing in their native languages now, versus 10, 15 years ago, the, there's such a, a big and, and troubling difference. Unfortunately, I'm not on the ground to, you know, to kind of offer any educated insights, but I think we can still offer incentives that will drive people to, to write in our language, give book prizes. Most book prizes are in, in English. Um, I don't know of a book prize really in my car. Well, I think there's one that, recently, that they recently started this year. But if we had more of those things, then maybe young people would, 
you know, would be inspired to write in their own language. That, that would help. But it's, it's really saddening. It's really saddening. What do you think are some of the things holding back these voices from being heard? You talk about money being an issue for some of the writers. Mm -hmm. What else is holding them back besides money? Um, money being an issue, part of it is the silencing that I was talking about. Not everybody is comfortable to tell the story. Um, I don't think we have a lot, a lot of holding back from from the artists themselves, but I think the environment, you know, this, the, the kinds of the, you know support and the absence of workshops. Part of what is not happening back home that I wish could happen is just seeing kids being able to take a creative writing class, you know, at university level and starting writing and uh, writing theory seriously, which. I wouldn't have done because I don't see my dad letting me go study creative writing back home, you know. Um, I came here to study law and I didn't tell my family that I was going for an MFA. The good thing with law is that you can do English first and then go to law school. So I kept telling people I'm going to law school until, until recently. So, mm -hmm. But I think if we reach that, that level of respecting, not just writing but the arts, you know, because, I don't know, I, I can't speak for every African in here, but when I was growing up, our artistic efforts were really, were just called cute, you know? Nobody told you you could pursue this and become a dancer or become a painter or whatever. You were encouraged, but then your parents told you to go study math, which is, which is something I couldn't do, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So what do you think needs to change for us to appreciate the art more? not just in Zimbabwe, but around the globe Africa. Because I think it's, that's a challenge that a lot of people in the room with. The issue of math being placed over, say, singing, or say, dancing. Mm -hmm. So how can we change that? Um, I think Nigeria is one of the places that I, I admire in terms, of, in terms of trying to support the, the arts. I think I, I met a few Nigerian publishers in the UK. And when you are looking at African writing, new African writing, there are more, I think there are more Nigerian writers writing. I have a friend of mine who, who publishes Munyori Journal and Story Time, and they, I think they've done two, three anthologies. And uh, one of his comments was, he's getting just too much writing from Nigeria, you know. Uh, I don't know how that is, but whatever is happening there is something that could be replicated in other parts. You know, I would be comfortable with talking to the people on the ground first and seeing what we can do. Any other, are there any writers in here, just out of curiosity? She's a writer. Besides my sister over there. You are a writer as well? Yes. Okay. I, I always say some writers are writers, but they don't know it, you know. Um, I teach creative writing and you, you get students who have never taken a writing class, but they have the voice, you know, they have the voice to, to, to write, they have the stories. And then my class becomes sort of that, that self-discovery uh, thing that gets them interested in writing. So if you can, I think if you are, if you are human, you have lived, you have, you have stories, really. Um, and I think we tell stories all the time to our friends. And, but if there are things that you care about, Get it on the page. You know, we, we, need, we need your stories. I think it's African, not just to write, but also to do poetry and do songs. Yes. So when you spoke about songs and you said that, mm -hmm. so how do these type of writing and other things that people can borrow from poetry and from songs to improve their writing or to improve their way around? Um, poetry, for me, poetry is really, is really close because I, you know, my, my prose, I try to be poetic. Unfortunately, most people have read uh, Hitting Budapest, and that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's really, really representative because, it, it, you know, I was trying to juggle, to try something new, but my work borrows a lot from poetry. I actually started writing poetry before I moved to, to stories, um, and then songs. I think you learn the, the technical parts of writing because you are still up trying to, uh, to appeal to the emotion. You are looking at rhythm. You are looking at you know, sound and all those things. Okay, um, there are other questions. Can I have one more, please? <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been kind of busy, but it's so awesome to have you here. Um, I'm struck by your 
sisters and, and maybe um, on, on, t on the word letters and text mm -hmm. and writing, right? Mm -hmm. So putting the story on the paper. Yes. Um, uh, I guess for a long time, um, Africans have been telling stories, not necessarily writing stories. And certainly what you said about uh, uh, stories in, or books in their brain do not make it outside because mm -hmm. so much is lost in translation. What would you think in terms of um, uh, privileging other stories that are not necessarily in text form as part of African literature? And I think of performances and songs, mm -hmm. and those are the forms of storytelling, mm -hmm. theater, theater. Mm -hmm. Um, I think theatre is actually coming up in very refreshing degrees. In the, you know, I, I'm reluctant to speak for the whole of Africa, but I think in Southern Africa, really, um, in the past five years, I think theatre has really made, a, made its way to, towards the centre of the state. And people are consuming, consuming it, uh, maybe because it's slowly learning to tie itself to the political, so that people really just very, just very urgent to, to their lives. But you're right, I think those other forms should, should also come you know, to the stage. I, I hope, like I said before, that it becomes urgent to, to people and our governments, and yeah, especially the governments, because they do have the, the funding, the kind of resources to, to make that happen. Else? Yeah, I was wondering, maybe in closing, uh, I think we're all very weak to stories and there's always that one story that you remember being told when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if maybe in closing today you could share <laughs> one of those stories. We can put a chair here for you so it can create the scene and all that. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it, it's long, man. <laughs> you know your grandmother's stories. <laughs> but uh, I, I will say that in as much as I liked my, my grandmother was she was just awesome and I always say she taught me to write because the way she would get into form when she was talking about a story the way she would bring character but I, I was also interested in listening grown up people talk you know maybe that was gossip on my part like the story you know you go listen to a story um, and during the day you tell it to your your friends on the street and that story spreads so that's i think that's part of what you know made my 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 republic of stories but yes i had ample stories of you know uh, told around the fire i think somebody told about their grandmother was that you yes, it was. yeah <laughs> so and my dad too interestingly i don't, I don't know how, how much fathers told stories to their kids back home Maybe we stick it there. Oh, your dad did? My dad was a storyteller. Oh, okay. My, my dad was, uh, I, I thought it was a woman's scene, the scene of, yeah, but my dad would only tell them if he was drunk, though. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was not a friendly man. He, he's awesome now, maybe because I'm grown. But he was the kind of man that, you know, when he came from work, he just stopped acting up. Then. And behave, but when he got drunk, he would sit down and tell you stories. These fascinating stories, because he, he fought in the war and whatnot. And I'm always right now. I'm trying to get him in that place where he can write his things before he goes. You know, because that's a generation of people who won't be with us. But in terms of these genres that we don't have that much in African literature, this I'm confident. You know, uh, I'm confident to talk for the whole of Africa. I think we need help in creative nonfiction. We are not comfortable telling true stories. I'm not sure why. Um, but I'm interested in the stories of his generation because those are the people who went to war. Those are the people who were present when, you know, uh, the grandparents, when white people came. Uh, we don't get that perspective. So I don't know what we can do to get them to talk but maybe record, record their voices and rewrite, I don't know. Okay. Yes, yes, drinks, drinks. I, I'm going to do research. Um. <laughs> I won't finish that thought. <laughs> Any, anybody else? I like your looks, I like your hair. <laughs> that was funny.
All right, I think this will bring us to the end of the story. There is one over there. I don't have there. much to say, and yeah, maybe I can say something. I'm from Nigeria. Yes. And I was actually sort of tickled when you say most of the writers mm -hmm. from Nigeria. Are they writing in uh, English or Nigeria? They are, they are writing in English, and there's this website called Storytime. It's by Ivo Hartman, he's a Zimbabwean uh, editor, and Emmanuel Sikauke. And the majority of the stories, if you go there, they are young, aspiring, you know, aspiring writers. And I'm fascinated by what is it that's pushing the Nigerian youth to, to write in comparison to people from my country, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's kind of uh, nice to know, but uh, we have complications of 600 ethnic groups in Nigeria, as yes. you might know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wish that some of the stories too would have come in a Nigerian language, but see how, yeah. how it wouldn't work. And I think, I don't know why um, we are not really writing or reading culture, mm -hmm. I would say, especially. I come from a little town mm -hmm. in Nigeria, mm -hmm. and uh, what people don't do, they just don't read for enjoyment. Yes. I think they, they read if they have to write an exam. Mm -hmm. and, I, <laughs> and I don't know whether there's anything we can do to inspire people mm -hmm. to even want to read. Mm -hmm. I'm not particularly saying that your writing must be read by mm -hmm. Africa. Because for most part, I think it's the West that is very ignorant of Africa. Yes. If you can get through to the West about what Africa is, I think that's a big enough job. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we are happy about that. Okay. And with time, if we can also sensitize our people about mm -hmm. you know, the importance of reading mm -hmm. and writing even, Yes. Then we would be able to get Africans also to read their to stories. Read their stories. The African stories. Mm -hmm. But right now I'm just content that you are able to write. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's really it. Mm -hmm. Because I had some experiences and uh, that's way back in Halifax mm -hmm. in 1977. Mm -hmm. I was in the bus stop and a nice Looking young white guy just <laughs> 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 by and he was so friendly. I felt comfortable uh -huh. talking with him, but I had dressed in this terribly Nigerian dress, mm -hmm. which goes from the down top at top. And so he looked and said, he asked me, he said, "Is Africa still a jungle?" And I said, I'm sorry, and he said, is Africa still a jungle? Mm -hmm. I said, no, not as, as, as much as Canada is. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, um, most of the places in Africa have mm -hmm. them. So he was annoyed. Uh -huh. and I, thought, I thought he annoyed me, but yes. now he's the one who is annoyed. But the, the thing <laughs> is that, that was just ignorance. Mm -hmm. That young man was very friendly. He was very nice, but he thought that I shouldn't be able to answer him back the way he had talked to me. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, of course, know the lady she's talking to. Yeah. <laughs> Not only that, I came with that problem to a class in UBC. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I, tell me, why should that guy think that I offended him when he offended me? And mm -hmm. I was the only black woman in the, in, in the class. And someone, you know, a white guy, very ignorant as well, <laughs> said, um, you know, we thought that, you know, we were taught to believe that the African is actually not the same as the white person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he, he quoted a situation where they went on a camping trip mm -hmm. with uh, the houseboy that works in his house, who was also an African. Mm -hmm. they, he would pitch his tent over there and ours is here. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, call him, that's fine. That was true, that was what you went through. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I appreciated him yeah. because he talked the truth. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have someone talk the truth and somebody that would be pretending. But mm -hmm. I said, well, just think about it, we are all humans. Yeah. What if I think I am better than you mm -hmm. and you think you are better than me? We have equal right to vote, 
vote. And so you can't convince me that you are better, and mm -hmm. I can't convince you, and we haven't yet anything. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is for me to say, you are really wonderful. And then you two, you see me and you say, yeah, I like you too. And that's how the world can go. Mm -hmm. Then she <laughs> agreed at the end. Mm -hmm. But I'm just telling you the fact that um, things have improved mm -hmm. very much, and I am very happy to be in a place where we are even discussing African literature. Mm -hmm. I think I should also tell my story on 2002, sometime in this African initiative, which might have been the start mm -hmm. of the need for the African initiative. But we started by our arts, our food, our drama, and mm -hmm. now it's coming up. Mm -hmm. So something must start somewhere, yes. and I think we shouldn't be in a hurry. We'll be patient, and mm -hmm. things will go and reach where we want them. Thank you. Thank you. as you hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm especially saying this because I, I feel like there are people, seasoned educators who have been teaching for more than I've been teaching. But I find that interesting um, because I think our education, given that we really inherited it, I don't think we, we played a fundamental role in defining our own education in a way that was aware of the uniqueness of our culture. And I think that's something that we should bring more of. And I, I, I think that would help to, to get us there. I don't know how other educators feel about that. I kind of have a comment on what you just said. I uh -huh. think, personally, I think we're missing the purpose of what education is mm -hmm. before even we get education. I think Nelson Mandela got it right when he said, Education is basically character building. It, it should transform your life in all areas. Yeah. But right now, let, let me just take one example in UBC, a class I, I teach sometimes, I ask my students. Now, what is the purpose? What are you going to get out of here after you're done? He said, well, I'm going to have a good job. <laughs> right? Making 45,000, 100,000, 100,000. It's good, but I think that education See, by many Africans, for example, my grandfather used to tell me, you know what, 
just go get it because you should transform your life. Mm -hmm. Not only yourself inside, but also to transform society, to transform also everything around you. Mm -hmm. Because when you take the word education, educare means leading somebody out of darkness. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I, I think we're not doing that. I think we're just going to school for the sake of going to school. I, I teach to a test sometimes, which is bad because we do that. Mm -hmm. Students want to have A or B. They just want to say, oh, what's going to be the test tomorrow? <laughs> like, I'm not teaching to see what's going to be the test. I'm trying to see that what I'm teaching you, the language, you can use it for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're not, we're not actually doing that. And also, I just want to make one final comment on you know, diversity in the classroom, basically, because I, I have been teaching you for a while. And I, it, it's really sad to see that diversity as an end. Mm -hmm. Not a mean to an end. Because mm -hmm. you go to a classroom, you find Mustafa from Senegal, from different places. It's, it's easy to bring bodies in the classroom. Yes. But are we talking to each other? Mm -hmm. Do we interact with each other? No, we don't. And I think that's why we have to reassess the whole concept of what education is all about. I think we're we are missing the point. That's why we will see that what's going on in this world, many people are killing each other, and yet they are PhDs. You have doctors who can you know, cure anything. You have people who have all education that they have, and yet mm -hmm. we are more miserable right now because we are not focusing on that capital building, mm -hmm. something that should transform our life and transform our society. We are not on that direction yet. Uh, that, that's, that's true and, and very sad. I, I, I was especially you know, interested in how What's your name? Sorry, Mustafa. Mustafa mentioned the, the obsession with grades with students, and and for my class, especially the creative writing class, I don't give grades. Show up, speak, do your work, um, and I have students bothering me throughout the semester. How am I doing? How am I doing? And I just tell them up front that I am not interested in giving you a grade. You're coming and you're taking part and you're talking to other students. Uh, is what's gonna count at the end of the semester. And they actually do better than other students who do great because somebody's writing or doing work from, from within uh, versus performing as, you know, as performance. So I don't know how practical that is though, given where we are in the setting and how the, the, the system is structured. But I think on an individual level, um, I'm trying to make that difference on an individual level. My teaching is not, you know, when my students leave my class, one of their comments is, this, this, my style is very different from what they're used to. And that's part of what I'm trying to, to, to instill. I think education should be transformative, knowing that education is really what stays with you when you leave the classroom, when you leave the, the university, so. Mm -hmm. So. I am starving. <laughs> <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we have to end. Um, there will be a reception afterwards for those of you who have comments or who still want to keep talking. Um, the Africa Awareness Initiative would like to thank you, Novella, for gracing us with your presence. I think just from the response that we've got from the room and the conversation that has just gone on, you know, I think mm -hmm. this was really necessary. And just to have you here um, as that facilitator, we're so grateful. Thank so, you. Thank you, thank you so very much.